friends, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making here at Eric Schaefer Guitars. We are working on guitar number 86, our first prototype parlor guitar here. And if you watched the last video that I did, then you actually saw me playing this guitar for the first time in the white, which means without a finish. Uh, but now we are basically ready to do the finish. I wanted to do this video I'm 90% or 80% of the way done the process of pouring over this guitar, just looking at all the details, making sure I'm happy with everything, and fixing any little issues that I see, any little gaps to fill, things like that. And uh, usually there's kind of a small laundry list of things to do. Not too much here. I did a bunch of them last night, and I took some footage of what I did last night. So I'll include that. I'll kind of splice that in as we go over this, but then I'll also do some things live on the spot here for you as well. Why don't we go ahead and start on the top and I will uh, grab the camera and give you guys a look. First of all, one of the first things to look for are gaps along the binding and thankfully I have none here on the top side. Gaps on the soundboard side are much harder to fill, repair, and make look decent than they are on the back. As you'll see, we'll take a look at the back. In a little bit, there were gaps back there, but that's good. I don't have any up here, so we can check that off our list. I do have some tear out up in here. I don't know if you can see that. And that is tear out. It's not compressed wood. So an indentation is different than tear out. If you have an indentation, like say from dropping something onto the top or pressing your thumbnail into it a little bit, that can actually pretty easily be steamed out because all of the wood is still there. It's just compressed. So if we add a little bit of moisture and heat it up, those fibers will actually swell and they will return to level and you can just kind of sand it again and then you're back to normal which is pretty cool. It's a neat trick. You can do it with a soldering iron. This is tear out, like I said. I'm still going to do the soldering iron trick on this because sometimes raising the grain can help a tiny bit, even though th that wood is missing. It'll still help swell those fibers and make it less obvious. But other than that, I'm just going to sand this a little bit more than the other areas to kind of take the edge off of that. And sometimes when you have deep tear out like that, and you're trying to sand it away, you're not trying to fill, like patch fill in that tear out. Which, by the way, I did over here and I made a video on it. If you go back a little bit in my catalog of videos, you can see how to really fill a fill and repair a deep gouge in the soundboard. With these, though, these are much smaller. I'm not gonna be able to, to fill those in that same way. This really is a case of compromise where I'm going to sand a very slight, not noticeable hollow in here with a soft sanding block. In the end, I might even leave a little bit of the gouge there and just call it character. But I just want to, you know, find the compromise and make it less obvious. So that's all I'm gonna be doing on the top. These kind of dark spots here, I'm gonna sand a little more there because I think that indicates a low spot that is lower than the plane of the rest of the top so if I sand more in that area with a soft block these two dark spots should go away I assume unless that's a part of the character of the wood we'll find out all right let's go ahead and plug in my soldering iron here this is actually an extra soldering iron that I have around uh, kind of a junky one with a very degraded tip but I like to keep it around for stuff like this so I don't have to you know use my other tools that I like. So I got my soldering iron heating up. While that's heating up, let's talk about what else we got. I got a little cup of water here and a piece of cardboard. It's a good idea, by the way, to cut your piece of cardboard into a sort of triangle shape because we're going to use the tip. It's a little easier to paint our moisture on and to target with our soldering iron. If we just have a nice pointy tip here, we can actually see where the damaged area is a lot better than if you have a square piece of cardboard. It does not take long for this to heat up. I can dip it in the water there, the tip, and hear it steam. So it's, uh, it's hot now. There goes the trash truck. I'll wait for that to get out of here. 
<laughs> it's kind of loud. All right, we're good to go. So I'm going to dip my cardboard in there. Okay, so I got some moisture. And then I am just going to place that right on the area and sort of walk, put, put the tip on there and walk it along the damaged area. So the cardboard is protecting the wood from the iron, which would, you know, burn it. And it's also soaking up that moisture and, you know, giving you sort of a reservoir of moisture to work with for a little while until it, you know, your cardboard dries out and you dip it in there again. Now remember, we want damp. We don't need it to be dripping wet. And I can see this working right now. And again, I know that this wood was torn out, so this might not work entirely, but it always helps at least a little bit. And my damn phone is ringing in my pocket. Nothing I can do about that right now. <laughs> How many times have you guys heard my phone on this show? Okay, that'll do. Definitely want to unplug that right away. That's a, you know, source of fires and things like that. If you forget about that. All right, leave that alone for a second. It's going to rise up and we're going to sand it back and it should be a little bit better. Okay, now I'm going to sand that back first with a small flat block right here, 220 grit sandpaper, and then also with a soft block. So the soft block is going to help get down and kind of scoop, create basically a very subtle depression in this area to get down to the low point of those tear outs. And the flat block is just there to make sure that I don't do that too much to the point where it's obvious. So you're, again, it's a compromise here. If I really hollow this out, when I put the finish on here, there's going to be a shine to the finish in that hollow. And when the sun hits it, you'll notice that there's a depression there and it'll just look kind of gross. So again, if we are subtle about it, it will look not gross. All right, so first I'll take this. And I can see from raising that grain that we did deal with the problem a little bit. Of course, I'm sanding with the grain. Never straight cross grain. Now, inside corners like this are especially tricky. If all this stuff was like out here, this would be really easy and I would feel confident in even sanding more, but when you're up against a wall like this, it's it's difficult to get the sandpaper right all the way into that corner. And so you end up having like a weird little ledge if you're not careful. This is a definitely a less is more kind of thing. That's what you learn over time from doing multiple guitars is not to overdo stuff like this. I remember in the beginning when I first started making guitars, <laughs> I would always try to, whatever little thing there was, even if it wasn't very offensive looking, I would always try to sand until I got completely down to the level of it. And often with a flat block, not even with a soft block. And it would always end up causing other problems like, I remember sanding through the purfling on, on one guitar, sanding through the rosette, and then you honestly just make things a lot worse. Chasing something really tiny uh, that nobody's even, would have even noticed. All right, so I'm using the soft block to kind of dig down, hollow that out slightly, but then mitigating that with the flat block so I don't overdo it. Oh, and here's another little tip. I actually have, yeah, here it is. You can make little specialty blocks for certain situations like this. You see how this block has an angle like that so that I can get into that corner a little more easily, right? Then I can with a straight square block like this. Yep, and that's got 220 grit on it, so we can use that. Okay. 
Okay, I think I'm gonna leave it there. It's still there, but it looks way better. All right, so that's the top. The sides look good. I already checked those over. There's no gaps or anything like that. On the sides, the sides are usually pretty easy to get right. Now the back, I actually had a lot of issues on and I'll explain why and then we'll uh, take a look at that. All right, so first of all, I had a little gap, which is very common at the junction of the butt joint here for my two pieces of ebony binding. Super easy to fill, just a little dot of black super glue, accelerate it and then sand it back and boom, it looks absolutely seamless when you're done with that just takes a second. If you don't have black super glue, you can use ebony dust and super glue, right? So kind of create some dust shavings, pepper them in there, and then put your dot of clear cyanoacrylate in there, and then you can sand that back and it'll look great. Some people even like to just put the super glue in there and then take a little sanding block and sand it before the super glue hardens and you'll create like a slurry of super glue and the surrounding dust. That method is kind of like an it depends kind of method because in this case, I'd rather have just jet black, either ebony dust or black super glue because the bindings are jet black. If I create a slurry of the surrounding wood, it'll be a mixture of the wangi, the white purfling and the ebony. And so it'll be a little bit lighter in color and thus a little bit more obvious. So you always have to think that way. Sometimes it makes sense to use uh, all the other elements around it, all the other little color tones and kind of blend them together if you're trying to sort of obscure something. But if you're repairing a fill around a very consistent color, you might as well just use that color for the fill. So super easy to do. Now let's, let's get to the big problem that I had here. And I already did the fix for this last night and I must say it's not perfect, but I'm, I'm happy with it. So I had an issue. I think my carrier was not level when I routed my purfling channels, not as level as it could be. And so I ended up with gaps, pretty large gaps. Whenever you have gaps like that, it's always sort of an it depends thing. It depends on what the wood is on the binding and what the wood is on the inside and whether your gap is a gap on the binding side or on the wangi side in this case. So what I did in some areas, I actually added an extra strip of the purfling to take up that space. That just seemed to make sense for me. And in other areas, I filled it with black super glue. Now I thought about making little splices of the wangi itself. Um, sometimes if the gap is very large, that's the best idea to do. These gaps were kind of on the edge where they might've been big enough to do that. It might've been appropriate, but also it might've made it look worse. So it really depends. Very small gaps. You can do ebony dust and super glue or black super glue or the, you know, sandpaper slurry of super glue trick. But when they get past a certain size, you really have to splice something in there. By the way, at this point, I should mention, if I haven't already, that these tricks that I'm talking about, don't do them on the top. If you have gaps on the top, super glue is, I mean, you can use them and I have used super glue on the top, but I'm very careful when I'm using it. It's sort of a nightmare with softwoods, especially if you're not aware of the issues. What happens is super glue, especially the more thin the viscosity is, it's going to deeply stain into that softwood. So even if it's a clear super glue, it's gonna change the color of the grain in the area where you repair it to sort of like this slightly grayish color. You wanna be careful with super glue and any of these tricks on the top side. On the top side, I tend to do more uh, either splicing bits in or honestly just accepting if, if the damage is small enough, sometimes you just gotta let it go. The soundboard side is tricky. That's why I'm simply extra careful with my actual routing. I really make sure I, I score my lines and do everything just right. And that the bit on my binding tower jig is super fresh and sharp. And uh, sometimes that means cleaning it or even eventually updating the bit by buying a new one. Right here, I have sort of this little flip uh, where the extra purfling piece 
is it kind of flared up and separated from the other piece just slightly, which makes that fill very apparent. And I think if I can hide that, it'd be a little bit better. So actually, I'm gonna see if I can do something with that right now. I don't think that will be very difficult. So if I take a dental pick, I have a whole set actually of these dental picks and you can get them for like, I don't know, five bucks on eBay or Amazon. If you look up dental picks, you know, I always, I would have thought before, I actually held off on getting dental picks for a while. I, every time I went to the dentist, I thought, man, those things would be great to have in the shop. But, you know, with the way medical grade equipment works and the outrageous prices that they could charge for that sort of stuff, I always just assumed that this type of equipment, you'd have to get it, you know, handed down to you or something for it to be anywhere near reasonable. But I was very shocked to find this stuff's very cheap. It's about five bucks for a whole set. So um, you should definitely add that to your kit of Luthery supplies. So what I'm gonna do here, let me pull the camera in if I can a little bit closer. So I've got that white little flip and I'm actually gonna take this pick. This has a sharpened end, a slightly sharpened end, and I'm gonna scratch out that little piece that's separating and then we're gonna fill it with black super glue. So this is gonna be a very small scratch, very targeted. Luckily, the strip is softer than the surrounding wood, so that makes it easier. All right, I think that's deep enough. Let's hit it with black super glue. Now, you gotta be careful with your super glues and with your purfling strips. It's always possible that this is going to stain the purfling strip, especially if it's a white color like this. Depends on what the material is. So. You, you want to test it on a piece of scrap. Actually, before I started doing any work on the back here, I took a piece of purfling that I, a little scrap piece that I had lying around, and I just put some super glue on it to see how it reacted to that. Remember, test, test, test on scrap, always. Even if I tell you something's gonna be a certain way, uh, don't take my word for it. Test on scrap, everything. All right, I think that looks a little bit better. Still a little bit of a transition there. You can notice it, but better than it was. Now this area right up here at the top where I have my two miters, I really don't love how this came out. Again, with that extra strip, it just starts to uh, cause problems and become obvious right at that miter there. You can see it's separating slightly and uh, it just, the miter doesn't quite meet up as good as it could. Now, this isn't a typical amount of repair work, by the way, <laughs> for the back, for me at least. I had an issue. I had an issue for sure with that uh, carrier and it, it was tilted a little bit. Now, if this was going to a customer, which this is not, this is a prototype and I'm making it for myself, but if this was going to a customer, I would actually route away the whole thing and redo it, right? That's always a possibility and that's always, uh, really it's it's the best thing to do as much as it kind of kills you and frustrates you to actually sort of go back to the drawing board like that it's a major step back but that would be a way to make this a truly right although with these tricks i'm showing you you can make it pretty damn good now i'm thinking this so this side here that's bothering me i might do a similar thing that i did here um i'm trying to think right now is it really worth doing because I could make it look worse, right? That's always the risk. That's a tough one. This one looks looks difficult. It's a lot of distance to scratch out with this and then fill. And I have to, to make it blend and not look awkward. All right, screw it. Let's try it. I'm here to entertain. So <laughs> everybody likes a good train wreck. Let's give this a shot. Hmm. I know I can kind of plan this out first. What I mean by that is I can take a pencil and draw it, kind of shade out what I want to remove. So like that, and then I need this to just kind of pinch off or taper off in a natural, non-obvious way. All right, 
right, that's a lot of digging there, but if I'm careful, that's the thing I'm worried about is for that long of a stretch, not slipping, right? For the, this was so small, it was easy to just, you know, anchor my hand down and control that motion. But here, uh, I don't know. Let's, let's give it a shot. All right, so I think that's good for the first section. Now, I think I have a smaller point on one of these. I'm gonna see if I can use that to get the final little pinching off trailing section. Yeah, this one right here. So the trick to controlling this is to really anchor your hands down and just focus on a small area. And then I'm gonna move and re-anchor this is what I mean by anchor, like kind of plant the edges of my hands down so I have something stable to rest against. I'm gonna re-anchor and then work another really small area. This is so scary. <laughs> Let's try that out. Super glue time. Okay, a little more glue there than I wanted to come out, but I think it'll be fine. Okay, the big reveal here. All right, definitely better. Definitely, wow. It's not perfect. I mean, it, it really can't be perfect, but Honestly, that is as good as I expected that, as I could have imagined that working out to be. Great. I was nervous about that one. In fact, that area now looks better than what I did here, and this was easy. All right, I could spend forever, like, messing with these little things, and at some point you just end up chasing your tail, meaning you're, you make some things look better, some things look worse. Um, I think I'm at a good you know, uh, <laughs> let's call it good enough kind of state right now. Another thing I did last night, I came in and I reshaped these cheeks a little bit. It's something that I always do at this sort of finiting stage of the build. As I'm working on other parts of the guitar, I'm turning the guitar over in my hands and just simply seeing the neck, the horizon line of the neck from different angles while I'm working on other parts of the guitar, like the fretwork and such, I just notice lumps or unevenness or areas where there's either a low or a high spot. I notice those things. It just takes time with seeing the guitar. Uh, you would think by now I would, you know, be able to just kind of roll it over my hands and get it all just right before I attach the neck. But it's just the case that on every single guitar at this point, I always turn back to usually this cheeks area. That's where most of the, the trouble is. And uh, just give it a little refining uh, to make it right. But that's really the best way to spot inconsistencies, I find, is just to sight the horizon line, so to speak. I'm not sure if that's the best way to describe it. The horizon of the neck as you move your head around the contour and you'll see different things. Right? And then when you see something, you can take your pencil and kind of mark out that area and focus on it a little bit and then come back to rotating your head around that contour again. Lastly, I did also fill the little gaps below the fret tang. You know how when you cut your fret slots, you always want to cut them a little bit deeper than the fret tang. That leaves those little gaps. I filled those. And you know what? I actually made a little how-to type video for that last night. So... Let's go ahead and rewind in time to last night and take a look at that. Okay guys, I'm gonna show you how to fill the gaps under your fret tangs. So it's very common at the end of a build to have just these little gaps here under the fret tangs, simply because when we cut our fret slots, if you did things right, we made sure that our slots were not too shallow for the height of those tangs, because if your slot is even a hair, even just a 
couple thousandths of an inch or a thousandth of an inch too shallow, then your fret is not going to seat all the way. And that is definitely not good. So I always like to just give it a little bit of extra depth just to make sure. But now we have the issue of filling these. Although honestly, we could just not fill them and let whatever finish you're doing uh, kind of fall into there, which mm, you always kind of see it, whether that bothers you or not, I don't know. But if you did want to fill, I'm going to show you how, or at least how I do it. Now it could be as simple as putting a little dot of black super glue in there. And you know what, that can work out for you, but here's the thing, it tends to just suck down into the sort of bottomless cavity of that slot. You end up having to keep pouring it, pouring it in and you run the risk too of it actually coming out the other side and, and making a mess. And also this will always just look jet black. So if you have a pretty deep excess slot there, you'll be able to tell that something was filled. It'll look okay, but it won't look as good as if you do what I'm about to show you, which is take slivers of the existing wood, simply press that sliver in like that, and then snap it off. Now I'm gonna apply the glue. At this point, you could either do black super glue or if you just have clear super glue, that's fine too because that uh, piece of wood should be filling most of the space. So yeah, the way I get those slivers, by the way, I just use a piece of scrap wood and you take a chisel and you can just break off a sliver and this actually looks like a perfect sliver right here, but if, if this was a little chunkier, I can take it over to my sanding board and just kind of trim it up like that. So then we'll take this next piece, again, stick it in there as far as it'll go down, snap it off, and quickest way to do this is just first go down the line placing it in each one, snapping it off. It should only take you about two to five minutes, I'd say, to do this whole thing uh, with a couple of splinters like this and some super glue, preferably black super glue. But again, you can, you can do with the clear stuff uh, as long as you are using bits of uh, either ebony or in this case, wangi. All right, back to your regular schedule, regularly scheduled programming. And with that, this thing is now ready for finish. So I'm gonna take it over to the finishing room. By the way, when I say finishing room, it's not what you think. I don't have a spray booth or anything. I'm just doing a hand rubbed true oil finish for this guitar, but I do have a separate room, literally just for the purpose of it always kind of remaining dust free and ready to go for finishing. So I don't have to kind of convert my whole shop over to finishing and that way I can apply my coats to this guitar and actually work on other projects in the main part of the shop. Well, anyway, I'm going to carry this over to the finishing room. Uh, I'm going to try and get these coats on pretty quick because I am very excited to put strings back on this. I know I played it a little bit in the last video, but I want to play it some more. I want to get an end pin on it. I want to get a strap on it and I want to be able to walk around my property um, both here at the shop and at my home, walk around in the woods and play this tiny little guitar because in my mind, that's what this is made to do. This is a walk-in guitar. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.